If you spent any time driving around America recently, you may have noticed that an awful lot of the country seems to have shriveled up and died. Take a trip on Route 2 in Maine sometime and count the boarded up paper mills and abandoned houses you see. Or head down Route 23 in Michigan or Ohio and consider the empty factories ringed with barbed wire. You'll see a lot of them. Outside the coastal cities, scenes like this are everywhere. This is your country now. Shuttered car dealerships next to defunct restaurants across the street from thrift stores and methadone clinics. That's America. Community after community. Desiccated. Empty husks with nothing left. Huge swaths of the United States look like that now. So what happened? Well, a lot of things happened. Some of them are complicated and hard to change. But one of the big factors in this slow-moving disaster is the utter transformation of the way our leaders think about the American economy. During the last Gilded Age, 125 years ago, America's ruling class may have been ostentatiously rich, and they were. Go to Newport, Rhode Island for proof, if you like. But it was still a recognizably American class. Tycoons accumulated fortunes, but they also felt some obligation to the country around them. Steel tycoon Andrew Carnegie famously built stone libraries around the country for the edification of people beneath him. John D. Rockefeller and many other so-called robber barons set aside huge portions of their wealth and, in some cases, their property to make this country better. Yellowstone, Acadia National Park, etc. Maybe most significantly, in January of 1914, Henry Ford more than doubled the prevailing factory wage to a then remarkable $5 for an eight-hour day. Ford didn't have to do that, but his company was succeeding and he thought he should. Some historians trace the creation of the American middle class to that decision. Either way, it is nearly impossible to imagine a big company doing anything like that today. Attitudes are just too different. Your average finance mogul looks at workers merely as cost to be reduced or eliminated entirely. Private equity isn't building a lot of public libraries these days. Instead, the model is ruthless economic efficiency. Buy a distressed company, outsource the jobs, liquidate the valuable assets, fire middle management, and once the smoke is cleared, dump what remains to the highest bidder, often in Asia. It's happened around the country. It has made a small number of people phenomenally rich. One of them is a New York-based hedge fund manager called Paul Singer, who, according to Forbes, has amassed a personal fortune of more than $3 billion. How has Singer made that money? We made a lot of it by purchasing sovereign debt from financially distressed countries, countries that were in trouble, usually at a massive discount. Once a country's economy regained some stability, Singer would bombard its government with lawsuits, a massive public relations campaign originating here in Washington, sometimes, until he made his money back with interest. The practice is called vulture capitalism, feeding off the carcass of a dying nation. In some ways, it's not so different from what Singer and his firm, Elliott Management, have done in this country and to this country. Over the past couple of decades, Elliott Management has made billions by buying large stakes in American companies, then firing workers, driving up short-term share prices, and in some cases taking government bailouts, insult to injury. Bloomberg News once described Singer as, quote, the world's most feared investor. And that tells you a lot. No one's even pretending Paul Singer's tactics are good for anyone but Paul Singer and his fund. Consider the case of Delphi, the automotive parts supplier. During the last financial crisis, a consortium of hedge funds, including Singer's Elliott Management, purchased Delphi. With Singer and the other funds at the helm, the company took billions of dollars in government bailouts paid for by you. Obama's auto czar compared those tactics to extortion, but they continued anyway. Once they had the bailout money, the funds moved most of Delphi's jobs overseas and then either cut retiree pensions entirely or shifted the cost to taxpayers. With later financial commitments at home and cheap factories abroad, Delphi's stock soared. According to investigative reporter Greg Pallast, of the 29 Delphi plants in operation when the hedge funds started buying Delphi's debt, only four were still operating in the United States by 2012. That means tens of thousands of unionized and white-collar workers lost their jobs. Paul Singer's hedge fund cashed out for more than a billion dollars. See how that works? Well, some countries, including the United Kingdom, have banned this kind of behavior. It bears no resemblance whatsoever to the capitalism we were promised in school. It creates nothing. It destroys entire cities. It couldn't be uglier or more destructive. So why is it still allowed in the United States? The short answer? Because people like Paul Singer have tremendous influence over our political process. Singer himself was the second largest donor to the Republican Party in 2016. He's given millions to a super PAC that supports Republican senators. 
You may never have heard of Paul Singer, which tells you a lot in itself, but in Washington, he is rock star famous. And that may be why he's almost certainly paying a lower effective tax rate than your average fireman. Just in case you're still wondering if our system is rigged. Oh, yeah, it is. Tonight, we want to tell you a little more about how Paul Singer does business. The story begins in a small town called Sydney, Nebraska, population 6,282. Two hours outside Denver, Sydney is the longtime home of the sporting goods retailer Cabela's, which sells fishing and hunting gear. In October of 2015, Singer's hedge fund disclosed an 11 percent stake in Cabela's and set about pushing the board to sell the company. Cabela's management, apparently fearing a long and costly fight with Singer, announced it would look for a buyer. Now, at the time, Cabela's was a relatively healthy company. It was posting nearly $2 billion a year in gross profits off $4 billion in revenue. There didn't seem to be any immediate need to sell. But Cabela's sold anyway after being pushed. So one year after Singer entered the equation, Bass Pro Shops announced the purchase of Cabela's. The company's stock price surged. Within a week, literally a week, Paul Singer cashed out. He bought the stock for $38 a share. He sold it for $63 a share. His hedge fund made at least $90 million up front and likely more over time. But in Sydney, Nebraska, it was a very different story. The residents of Sydney did not get rich. Oh, no, just the opposite. Their community was devastated, destroyed. The town lost nearly 2,000 jobs. A heartbreakingly familiar cascade began. People left, property values collapsed, and then people couldn't leave. They were trapped there. One of the last thriving small towns in this country went under. We recently sent two producers to Sydney, Nebraska, to survey the wreckage there and to consider what happened. Our producers talked to more than a dozen former Cabela's employees. Almost all of them refused to speak to us on camera, fearful of legal retribution from the famously vicious Paul Singer. But off camera, they told us their story. Here it is. Sydney is, uh, it's a great place to be. This is Sydney, Nebraska, a small town two hours outside of Denver. For decades, a sporting goods retailer, Cabela's, kept its headquarters in Sydney. As the company grew more prosperous, so did the town. Cabela's was the keystone employer. Our motto forever was small town values, big time opportunities. But that motto was turned on its head when Elliott Management Corporation, that's a New York-based hedge fund, managed by billionaire Paul Singer, took an ownership stake in Cabela's. When we got the news this company is coming in from New York City and buying a huge stake in Cabela's, that shakes things up. At the time, Cabela's was making more than a billion dollars a year. But Paul Singer's firm sensed it could make a quick buck by driving up the stock price by forcing a merger. The once thriving town of Sydney lost everything. I cried. The second I got the phone call, I couldn't help it. I, I bawled. That's how a longtime Cabela's employee reacted to news that she was losing her job. I had something good going. That was my future. And now I don't really know what my future is. Probably looking at around 2,000 jobs. 2,000 jobs gone? Yeah. Sydney was devastated. He ruined it. A good American town and just uh, destroyed it. Tim O'Connell runs the town's lumber yard. Before the merger, business was great. We were just buried, you know, with, with business. Now his customer base has collapsed. How many new homes have been built since Cabela's and Bass Pro merged? In the city limits here, there's been one. Last one year, house. One house. Before Paul Singer's hedge fund put Cabela's in its sights, Sydney was experiencing a building boom. We we're going to build a new housing subdivision to meet housing needs. All these great things were happening, and instead, we are working our tails off to try to figure out a way to survive. For the people of Sydney, it's been a disaster. Those who want to leave Sydney can't go. Housing values have collapsed, tethering them there. For those who want to stay, it's almost impossible to find a job. How long did it take you to find a new job? It took me just shy of five months. And is it as good as your old job? No, not even close. As Sydney collapsed, Wall Street cashed in. Paul Singer's hedge fund sold out before the merger was even complete. The fund made nearly a hundred million dollars. They don't care. They don't care about rural Nebraska, small town. I hope Paul Singer is, is proud of what he did. If money is that big of a god to him, it's a pretty sick human being. Well, as we were doing that story, we were warned repeatedly by people around Washington 
don't criticize Paul Singer. That's not a good idea. And as that package played, I got the following text from a very well-known person in Washington. Holy smokes, I can't believe you're doing this. I'm afraid of Paul Singer. We'll see what happens. Meanwhile, Ben Sass, and this may point to the point the texture was making, Ben Sass is a U.S. senator who represents the state of Nebraska. Sydney, of course, isn't that large. But you might think the death of a town in his state would be of concern to Ben Sass, again, U.S. senator from Nebraska. But so far, it doesn't seem like he's ever commented on what's happened to Sydney. We looked hard. Then we called Sass's office to see if they could point to a time where he commented on the destruction of Sydney or simply supply a statement to us about what happened there. But Ben Sass's office didn't even respond to our producers. Huh, that's odd. But then here's one possible explanation for that. During his Senate run, Ben Sass received the largest possible donation from Paul Singer. 